This week, we welcome back Juan Martinez of Hoya de Nicaragua. In the Debonair Ideal segment, we'll discuss essential elements to creating a cigar smoker-friendly man cave. In the Stogies of the Week, we'll talk about which boxes should fill your humidor and much more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady, it's the Stogie Geek Show. Cuba. Abe Flores opened his PDR cigar factory in the Dominican Republic over 10 years ago. Abe is one of the hottest boutique cigar makers in the industry today, earning the number 10 spot on Cigar Aficionado's Top 25 Cigars of 2014 with the Abe Flores 1975 Siri Pravada. Abe and his team use Cuban blending traditions in a modern boutique Dominican factory. Smoke PDR cigars and cut, light, and taste what they love to do. Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the Ultra Premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Azan Cigars, Naya, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed to humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure the progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. AJ Fernandez Cigars, makers of the San Latano, one of the most talked about cigars in recent years, is now offering a groundbreaking line extension, the San Latano Bull. The San Latano Bull features an extensively aged and hearty core of Nicaraguan long fillers nestled beneath an attractive Ecuadorian Sumatra wrapper. Housed in a cedar sleeve which depicts the outline of a bull, only solidifies this cigar as a full-flavored cigar. Removing the sleeve reveals a box-pressed cigar with a beautiful, oily, and smooth chocolate brown wrapper. The San Latano Bull burns nice and neat as it issues columns of smoke hitting you with a wall of spice followed by leather and cedar. This densely packed cigar intensifies in deep, rich flavors and becomes a flavor bomb halfway through, only getting better with each passing draw. Strong yet smooth and perfectly balanced A.J. Fernandez, who many have called a tobacco prodigy, has somehow pushed the already spectacular San Latino line of cigars forward with the Bull. A.J. Fernandez challenges you to take on the Bull, Cigar Snob's number 8 cigar of the year for 2014. Partagas, since its introduction in 2014, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte has won critical acclaim and a devoted legion of fans. Flawless construction and full-bodied flavor are the hallmarks of this rich, dimensional cigar that features prevalent notes of wood and coffee. Made with a unique blend spanning three continents, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte is the perfect choice for any cigar smoking occasion. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Stogie Geek Show. I'm your host, Paul Astorian, joined on the lines via Skype by Mr. Will Cooper. Welcome, Will. Greetings, Paul. Greetings, everybody. And we are going to be smoking, drinking, having a good time here on the Stogie Geek Show. Very excited, as always. We've got a fantastic interview lined up. We're going to talk about how to build an awesome cigar smoker-friendly man cave. We're going to talk about Stogies of the Week. Lots of good things to talk about there. I, I have a lot of box-worthy rated cigars this week, Will, so you better make room in your humidors uh, uh, after my recommendations this week. Yeah, I have a couple as well. Yep. That's good. So, Will, why don't you uh, introduce our, our special guest? Um, well, we're going to welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show, uh, Mr. Juan Martinez, uh, president of Hoya de Nicaragua. Juan, it's uh, Will in North Carolina and Paul in Rhode Island. How are you doing tonight? Well, Paul, I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for having me once again. It's always a pleasure to, to chat with you uh, all the way from uh, Managua, Nicaragua. So, Juan, um, I've just lit up a, the Cuatro Cinco 
uh, cigar from Hoya de Nicaragua. Will as well. Uh, I'm smoking the Toro size, which is uh, a box press six and a half by 50. Why don't you tell our listeners uh, a little bit about this blend? Well, uh, this is called Cuatro Cinco Reserva Especial, and uh, this was a cigar introduced uh, in IPCPR 2015 in, in July, a few months back. And uh, if you may recall, uh, back in 2013, when our factory was celebrating its 45th anniversary, we launched a limited edition uh, cigar called Cuatro Cinco, which in Spanish is four five. Uh, it was a cigar that uh, only 4,500 boxes of 10 were produced, a total of 45,000 cigars. And it was a limited edition, one run, one size, a 6x54. And uh, it flew. It flew uh, from our warehouse and it flew from, uh, from the shops. And uh, two years after that, uh, we decided to relaunch the, the brand in different formats to follow up the, the brand. It was so successful that a lot of people were, were basically craving for it. So uh, we decided to introduce the new Cuatro Cinco, which is a Reserva Especial. It so is the, um, is the Reserva Especial and the first Cuatro Cinco release the same or slightly different blends? They're slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, the core tobaccos that we are using, mainly the, uh, the fillers, and the wrapper are exactly the same, uh, obviously from different crop years and uh, from from different um, from different season. But the binder is is a little bit different. This this time we're using a Dominican binder, while in the previous occasion we were using only Nicaraguan tobacco. Mm -hmm. so what was the, the, the reason for the the change to the Dominican binder? Was it was it flavor? Was it burn? Um, was it just you couldn't get the other tobacco and you found this one to be comparable? A combination of the three, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we were looking for a binder that would allow the wrapper to burn uh, better. You know, uh, Nicaraguan wrapper, especially the thicker Ligero wrapper that we were using in the previous edition, was is is it's it's a it's a hard tobacco to to smoke. Uh, not only because it has a lot of flavor and strength, but it also it's thick. So uh, you struggle sometimes with uh, proper burn, and uh, although the cigar was an almost perfect cigar, uh, we thought that it could help a little bit using a Volado uh, binder from the Dominican Republic, which is basically a thinner uh, binder, which also adds a little bit of flavor and balances out the, you know, the, both the strength and the flavor profile of the Nicaraguan tobacco. And uh, finally, yes, indeed, we had uh, a lack of the tobaccos that we used uh, in the previous previous occasion. So we decided to use the uh, the Dominican binder. It ended up being being almost perfect because it achieved the goal that we were looking for to balance the flavor, but still give you a very nice solid burn uh, while continue to add to the complexity of the profile of the cigar. Mm -hmm. And now the uh, components of your filler is that the uh, super secret sauce. Well, it's not actually too secret. It's uh, a, in both occasions we are using fillers that have been aged in uh, vintage oak barrels. Uh, this have they are, these are oak barrels that uh, have more than thirty years of of uh, previous use in uh, in rum aging. So mm -hmm. we're using a lot of those barrels to age the fillers, the visos, the secos, and part of the ligeros. Uh, they've been aged for more than a year, so that also adds to the complexity and the balance, but also the smoothness of the flavor in the in the cigar. Mm. Yeah, no, it's very good, and uh, yeah. I was I really like your your size choices uh, in the Cuatro Cinco. Uh, it comes in a, a box press torp. Is a torpedo box pressed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, all the sizes smoking. are box. -pressed. All the sizes are box pressed. Okay, and it comes in a, a double robusto, five by fifty-six, in a petite Corona. I I find that a box pressing the torpedo is like the way to go. The torpedoes that I really yeah. love are all box pressed, <laughs> and I see a lot of cigar manufacturers coming out with this size. Was that was that something you experimented with before, or just said you I'm going to try it in this size and see what happens? Or no, uh, we wanted to have a, a, a figurado on on the lineup, and uh, because all of the all of the sizes are box pressed since the original uh we decided to to box press it 
Although we agree that uh, there is something in the in the box pressing that uh, makes the the torpedo even better than what it usually is. Uh, we've had uh, we've produced uh, some other brands uh, with that format, and they are an excellent cigar. Yeah, I find I get a better uh, like burn and draw when you box press the torpedo. Yes, yes, indeed. Is well, that because it's? Go ahead. The draw is. It's, it should be better with the box press uh, because of the way we construct the cigars in order to press them. Uh, obviously, you roll the cigar around, mm -hmm. but uh, the quantity of tobacco that you fill in the bunch of is, is, tends to be small, uh, smaller yeah, because you need to press it. And when you compress the tobacco, mm -hmm. obviously, you cannot have too much tobacco in it. So we generally roll the, uh, the cigars a little bit looser than, than, than usual. So that allows for a, a uh, freer, uh, freer draw, if you want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Will, you have more questions for Juan? Yeah, actually, um, as far as um, this, I find, uh, it was a comment first. I definitely am finding that there, when you have this box press torpedo, which is the size I'm really enjoying in this line, it definitely is concentrating those flavors a little um, more and it's there's definitely more of a richness I'm getting off this cigar um compared to the first one too. I mean would you say that's an accurate assessment? Yes, yes it is. Um uh, I personally am enjoying the uh, the torpedo also a little bit more than than the other sizes, although I feel that each one has its particular personality. Uh I think that the uh Dole Robusto it's it's a little bit more charged and stronger than the rest of the family. But uh, in any case uh, and compared to the original limited edition one, which was a six by fifty-four uh, Toro, um, the uh, the torpedo captures better the flavors, the complexity of the flavors. Uh, I yeah. get uh, I get more sweetness out of the torpedo. I get more some of the woodiness that we were looking for with the aging in the old barrels. And uh, oh, just a comment on that. To, just to clarify, when we decided to age the, the tobaccos in oak barrels back in, was close to 2010, 2011, that we started experimenting with aging tobaccos uh, in oak barrels, something that we did not invent and we, did not, and we do not claim to have invented, uh, we started noticing that the tobaccos were, were evolving differently than in the traditional aging uh, bales that we, we, we use in our traditional bodegas. Um, and although the cigar being aged in oak barrels is not intended to taste like the original liquor aged in the oak barrels, like say the rum that we uh, that was aged in the in the barrels, what we're looking for is for a different evolution of the taste inside the barrels, given not only by the wood but also by the uh, the the uh, the how do you call it, the charcoal inside of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the barrel that generally is used to age the, the, the liquors. So that's a clarification that we always give, a disclaimer that we're not intending the cigar to taste anything like uh, rum or anything like liquor, like some other products out there that, that uh, are designed to taste like the particular uh, liquor that they are associated with. In our case, it's just to, to give a different profile to the tobacco itself, all natural without adding anything to the flavor, uh, and to the content of the leaf. Now, Juan, you said before that um, traditionally you age tobacco um, in the bodega. It's mm -hmm. kind of in the open air in inside the bodega, right? And you bundle it together. Um, yes. Now, when you age it in the barrel, is that barrel completely sealed? Or, yes. you know, is there a way for air to pass through it in any capacity? Or, you know, do you kind of uh, open it up for a certain period of time? Like, what's the process when you age in a barrel? Well, first, the, the traditional aging is in bales and generally in big warehouses uh, with, uh, you know, humidity and temperature control in some cases. But generally with exposure to light, to oxygen, to the natural mm -hmm. flow of air in a warehouse. And uh, we do this in, in big bales that we call them. And it's basically almost like uh, big cushion, cushions of tobacco yeah. compressed. And uh, each bale can weigh between 80 to 120 pounds, depending on, 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 on the structure of the bale. And that's the way we generally age the tobaccos for years and years in the bodegas. 
with the barrel aging, what we do is, first of all, we select, we sort the tobaccos uh, once they have been, uh, you know, properly fermented and aged already in, mm -hmm. in the traditional way. We go through the second aging in the barrels. We select them, we sort them, we separate the leaves, and then we store them or include them in the, in the barrels. We seal the barrels for a few months, and uh, what happens is that you know, there is no natural movement of air as it would be outside, so mm -hmm. the air there is, is a little bit more static. The moisture is more concentrated because you have the barrel mm. uh, controlling the, the flow of moisture. Plus, it's it's dark. So there's those are three elements that mm. uh, influence the aging process of the tobacco inside the barrel. Every few months, we do open the barrels uh, and we rotate the tobaccos because we want almost all the leaves inside the tobacco to have contact amongst each other and with the barrel so that hmm. uh, you know, all the leaves get uh, enough of that uh, contact with the walls of the barrel that allow them to capture a little bit of that woody, oaky flavor perhaps from, from the walls. And this happens twice or three times per year and uh, that we rotate them. And after more than a year, we open it up and we use the tobaccos for the production. What, is it, what, it what does it smell like when you open one of those barrels? Does a tobacco at that stage still have an ammonia aroma, or does fermentation take care of that ammonia? And then, what is the what does it smell like when you open those barrels? Well, tobacco, when when even it, when even when it's aging, it's still uh, finalizing its fermentation process. Mm -hmm. So you will get a little bit of ammonia even even after it's been aging for 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 many years. Uh, slow, obviously, because you're not you're not instigating the fermentation as you would generally do in, a, in, a, in the pilones, mm -hmm. uh, but you would get a little bit of the ammonia, but with the, with the, uh, in the barrels, when you open them, you get a combination of smells uh, that don't necessarily translate to the flavor of the cigar. You yeah. get a little bit of the original rum, aged rum, mm -hmm. in its purity, because you know the, the, the rum in the barrel is, is uh, almost 90% alcohol before being bottled. So you still got a little bit of that, not a lot, uh, but you still have a little bit of that smell, sweetness, obviously, almost to the melassa, original to the rum, plus combined with the, uh, with the burned wood and the wood itself, plus a little bit of the ammonia and the natural smell of the tobacco. So you get a combination of all that, that, uh, you know, for us to capture that smell would be ideal and to, you know, have that, the cigar taste like that would be ideal, but uh, that's intense when we open the barrels. Once we're using the tobaccos and the cigars are being rolled and then the cigars are being aged, a lot of that smell uh, is lost. And uh, only the, the, the natural and the smooth flavors remain in the cigar. Now, do you put the wrapper, binder, and filler into the barrel or just one or more of the components? Just the fillers. Okay. Just, just the, the fillers, fillers uh, just the, the, the visos, the secos, and part of the lijeros. And just part of the lijeros, okay. Yes. And then the wrapper is also a lijero priming? Yes. The wrapper is an Habano Criollo from Nicaragua, lijero which is a, the, the thickest uh, of the classification that we use down here in Nicaragua. And uh, that, that's why it also adds a, adds a lot of the flavor to the cigar. Mm -hmm. Excellent. More questions for Juan? Well, Juan, when, you know, back again cause I, with the barrel aging theme, when you did the original Cuatro Cinco, was that also um, using the barrel aged fillers? Yes. That was the first time that we used tobaccos aged there. Uh, we were aging the tobacco since uh, late 2010, 2011 uh, in the barrels, and we started using them and rolling the cigars in late 2012 for the introduction of the limited edition Cuatro Cinco. Now the new this the 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 Reserva, uh, um, the Reserva, uh, um, this is still I'd say limited in production, right? So it, you're doing small batches of this, from what I understand. Of the yes, Reserva uh, Special. This cigar is unfortunately because, you know, it, it's a very time intensive process, what we're doing with the barrels. Also, um, it's a limited production of no more than 500 boxes per month of all the sizes. So even today, we're still uh, in back order in some accounts in the United States. 
because it's so limited that we're not able to satisfy all the demand uh, in, in one shot. So we call it a limited ongoing production. That's what we call this type of, of, of production. And uh, for the U.S., in fact, it's, uh, it's only available for DDRP accounts, which are basically the Jewish state, who is our U.S. distributor, uh, certified accounts that have the privilege of getting this product. And it's only about, uh, I think, around 300 stores in the United States. So now, do the barrels, speaking of how limited uh, the cigar is, do the barrels have a certain lifetime or lifespan uh, in, the, in this process? Like, do you cycle them out and get new ones after a while? Or Yes, they actually do. And it's interesting because in this process, we had to learn a lot about uh, not only the barrels, but the, the process of aging the original liquors. The, the, the barrels originally, more than I would say five decades ago, were used for aging bourbon. Mm -hmm. And then after they gave their life to bourbon, they were used to, for aging uh, rum. And for rum, they have a limited lifespan of 25 years. Uh, and then they use it for other smaller processes, smaller batches of, of rum. So those have been used in the rum for 20 to 30 years. And in our case, even though we continue using them, we feel that they also lose a little bit of their contribution with time. Mm. Uh, but in our case, because it's been you know five years, uh, we still have we still are have are using them without uh, replacing them. We right. expect to 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 be adding new barrels uh, in 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 the near future, and uh, we'll probably be replacing some of the older ones soon. So before you get them, how old are the barrels? They're more than 25 years old, right? 25 years just for the rum, but then you also, they were used in bourbon yeah. for how long, did you say? Exactly. Uh, for how long they were used in, in bourbon, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. They were used, uh, you know, more than 30 years ago, almost some of them were even 40 years ago used uh, for, the, for bourbon, but then they lasted all this time for rum. So I would say that some of the barrels, when you see them, they, are, they seem really, really old. Uh, yeah. They're almost like antique uh, yeah, uh, and that's cool. You could have from from almost forty years. I I, I can't expect them to have my, almost. 40 my years. grandfather would be so proud. You know, he grew, uh, you know, God rest his soul. He grew up in the depression, and he was very much uh, into like reusing things and using everything that you have. And he'd be so proud that these barrels are still serving a, a purpose all these years later. That's really cool. And we ex we expect them to 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 serve the purpose. Uh, our supplier of the barrels has a philosophy of, of not wasting anything in the sense of, of, of taking advantage of the historical value of the, of the, of the barrels. And uh, we think that we're going to do something similar to that. We're not going to destroy them and, and get rid of them. And we'll probably do something special with them mm. uh, and, and guarantee that the historical relevance of those, of those, of those you know, Original trees even uh, kept uh, are, are kept in, intact in the in the barrels. We could really use a barrel for decoration in our studio. I'm thinking now. I was so, thinking about that. That'd be fantastic. We'll, we'll, we'll look into that. <laughs> we can pay for <laughs> shipping. That's right. Yeah, I man, we could do that. We could do that. Will more for questions for Juan? Yeah. So Juan, you also did a few. What I liked about what you did with this cigar is you did some tweaks to the packaging to kind of differentiate this um, from the original. So this one I'm looking at it looks like it has more silver in the color scheme uh, on the banding, so to speak. Yes. Uh, one of the things, one of the almost philosophical debates that we had amongst our team and, and with some of our uh, distributors was that uh, we wanted to be truthful to the limited edition concept. Uh, meaning that, that that was something that you will not a, you will not be able to find uh, anywhere else after it's done, uh, and we tried to respect that, especially for the consumers and the smokers who trusted us with that meaning, and uh, that original blend will not be replicated. The original size will not be replicated, and every single box is numbered from one to four thousand five hundred in the original release. And uh, in order to differentiate that while still taking advantage of the value of the brand, which is Cuatro Cinco, and, 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 and a lot of, especially a lot of consumers enjoy the name of the brand and, and actually uh, felt that it captured the essence of the product very well, uh, we decided to tweak the packaging uh, by using a little bit more silver. The, previously, the previous one was more gold-oriented. 
the the second band was uh, gold. This one we're using a little bit of silver and and white also. So that when you have them side by side, it's clear that they come from the same family, but they're different. Sure, I, I, and, and I like family. that too. But, Yeah, and like I said, they're definitely, they're, you know, they're in the same wheelhouse, but they're different smokes. I mean, this is, like I said, this is definitely smoking different than the original. So, I, you know, once you once you light this thing up, you're going to know that this is, it's a different blend, but no shortage. I actually think uh, I'm really enjoying this, the, the new blend on this a lot. Yeah, but I am as well. Still, this is a this is a fantastic smoke. I can't yeah. wait. I, I have the Torpedo. I can't wait to light that up now. I think you're really going to like that one, Paul. Yeah. But still, is familiar enough to the original one that you know that it's 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 a close cousin or even a brother from the original one without being the identical one. Now, what we did remain, what we did keep though, was something very special that we do, did for the for the first release. That uh, in the back of every single band of the cigars, there were three elements that depicted or celebrated um, the the forty five years of our factory, and in fact. The 45 years of our industry, because Hoya de Nicaragua, as we've spoken in the past, is the first factory of cigars established in Nicaragua. And as such, the one that started the movement towards the Nicaraguan cigar industry. And although we don't want to sound uh, too proud, we feel uh, that the company is uh, responsible of what our industry has achieved today. Not only because of it started at all, but because it's been an institution that has celebrated uh, exactly. That's the band. And in that band, that's the first picture taken of the production floor back in the late 1960s. And uh, it's a picture that depicts the, the ladies that were rollers back at the time. And uh, the cigar ultimately is a tribute to them, to the people who started it all. And if you see closer, uh, more towards the left of the band, you will see a lady that is looking to over her shoulder. Her name is Marta, and to the left, another lady called Francisca. And both of them, they started being rollers at the factory while they were very young. And uh, they are now heads of their respective department. They've been working with the factory for more than 47 years, oh. and uh, they continue to dedicate their life, their passion, their enthusiasm to this company. Uh, through a lot of historical uh, ups and downs, they remained, and uh, this cigar basically is a tribute to them, because uh, ultimately they're the ones responsible of making this beautiful product. Not only this cigar, but all handmade products. And uh, so this is something that's very special, and we wanted to share with every consumer a little bit about the history of the company and uh, where the cigar comes from, because for us, every cigar has a meaning, and this one in particular is a tribute to the 45 years of, of our company and, and a celebration to that. And we wanted to keep this. And this is, this is something that we started with the original limited edition and something that we continue to do today. So when you, when you take up the band, you, will, you will always find a message regarding the product. Juan, I, you distribute um, in a lot of countries outside of the U.S. In your opinion, how have the palettes changed in a lot of the European and non-U.S. countries in terms of cigars? That's a, that's a very nice question. Um, we just came in September from uh, inter Tabac trade show, uh, which is the uh, European version of the IPCPR, but uh, I think double the size, bigger, because they include also you know, machine-made cigars, they include uh, all the electronic stuff and all that. And in that scenario, we get an interesting input of information about how the industry is changing in that side of the world. First, you have to recognize that Europe and most of the rest of the world, except the United States, cigars are satanized, basically, uh, as every other tobacco product. Even, even though you guys don't look at it that way, the United States is the freest of the free in terms of tobacco control and regulation up to tonight. Uh, in the sense that in the United States, you're able to open a humidor as big as you want. You can, you can have a lounge as big as you want. You can have events and give out free samples and have a hat that says Hoya de Nicaragua or a cutter branded with your brand. That does not happen in the rest of the world because it's so highly regulated. 
Uh, that does not happen in Spain, in, in the UK, plus taxes tend to be much, much higher in the rest of the world. So international consumers have it a little bit tougher uh, in the sense of being able to access variety of products coming from countries like ours or the Dominican Republics because of so many restrictions. On the other hand, they've been more used to enjoying uh, Cuban cigars also. So they have a longer tradition of uh, that particular flavor and uh, strength profile. So ultimately, uh, up to a few years ago, the preferences of the European smokers, the Asian smokers, and the Latin American smokers were quite different from the United States. While in the United States, there was the, uh, the preferred profile. It's something robust with a lot of flavors, a lot of uh, strength. Uh, the darker the, the, uh, the wrapper, the better. You know? the, the, the more smoke the cigar releases, the better. Uh, at least, on average, there, that's the perception that you get from the from the U.S. consumer. In Europe, they're more used to a medium to milder body cigar with the lighter wrappers, with not too much intense strength as as we are used to in this part of the world. Uh, but that has changed, and that has changed in our perspective for a few reasons. First of all, because of the advent of technology. Social media in particular has played an incredible role in exposing these consumers to what the rest of the world is smoking. And while when they see blogs, when they see Twitter posts, and when they see mm. social media, Facebook posts of, speak, of people smoking something different, they want to try it. And there's actually a, for us, there is a convergence from the European side towards the preferences of the traditionally American uh, side of, of smokes. In, in, in our case, for example, in the United States, our best seller of, over the past 15 years has been Antonio 1970, a strong full-bodied cigar. And in Europe, traditionally, our best seller was Classico, which is a very mild Connecticut shade cigar, a very smooth, silky, mild cigar. Over the past few years, we've seen the trend reverse. Mm -hmm. We've seen more popularity over the Antonio 1970 in Europe and more people enjoying full of strength. Uh, on the converse, we've also seen that, that the American consumer has gravitated a little bit towards the European palate, looking for mm. a maybe a more balanced, maybe a milder and also medium-bodied smoke. And that's also an influence of, of communication because you know you see a lot of blogs, even probably in your site, you've, uh, you've uh, reviewed or you've spoken about European editions of certain cigars. Uh, and that obviously has, has helped uh, uh, the U.S. consumer to get more informed and to be also be open to trying uh, the, the, the other side of the, of, of the palate. Yeah, that's so, interesting. I, di I didn't realize how much of the cross-pollinization was happening. Um, I was actually speaking to Lito Gomez the other day, and he said, you know, when I visited Europe, he said it was, it was amazing. He's like, European smokers are smoking all these 60 ring gauge cigars and these stronger cigars. He's like, that, that's like totally, uh, it, it like, you know, not surprising, but he's like, that's a trend that's happening out there that I never realized. Uh, yeah, in fact, I was, uh, I was in London in July uh, doing the relaunch of, uh, of Hoya, and we were doing an event at a very exclusive uh, store in, in the center of London where you imagine that you will only find, you know, the, the typical uh, traditional sizes. And to my surprise, one of the best-selling cigars in the store was a huge 8 by 80 or a 7 by 70. I don't remember the size, but it was one of the big rig gauge cigars. And I was quite surprised because I did not expect that, that the London smokers were, were enjoying that size of cigars. Not to speak about the cost of the cigars because they're... The, the taxes are applied by the weight of the cigar. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how much, how much a, a 8 by 80 can cost uh, in, in the UK. Uh, so that's, that was interesting to know. Mm -hmm. And, and you now you're seeing also, although in the, the, the past few years we, we've all seen the, the gravitation towards big range cigars in the US, you can also see now more people asking for smaller ring gauges and going back to the Lanceros, especially the, the, the cigar geeks and, and the... Uh, and the more connoisseurs kind of going to to thinner uh, ring gauge, and that's something that we see every year changing. Absolutely. That's something that we love about this industry. Every year is different. Mm -hmm. There's no static, which forces us to you know to to be dynamic and to change and to improve 
and to innovate also a little bit in response to all those changes in, in preferences. But it's a constant education process for you to keep uh, keep up with the market as it changes so rapidly. What's the strategy there? Is it really about visiting the various cigar shops and sitting down with people and having a cigar? I feel like that's a really big part of it in this industry. Yes, it is. Uh, for us, that is key, especially because we are Nicaraguans and we are based here. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to be on the streets in the United States uh, often. When we go there, we do our own, you know, our own research and our trying to understand what uh, what the the market is asking for. Sometimes we try to experiment, and, and instead of waiting for the market to ask, we try to propose and bring uh, interesting and different products to market. Uh, but we also do the events, visit stores, talk with the uh, with the consumers. Um, a lot of uh, social media we follow and uh, the digital uh, blogs and, and, and sites like yours that we follow just to, to get a sense of, of you know, what the, what's the status of the industry and how, how things are being seen today. But we also have uh, a yearly program called Cigar Safari with, uh, with the Drew Estate, which is a program in which we get from February to May of each year. Uh, groups of smokers and retailers that come down just for cigar tourism. And uh, we have workshops with them, and every single group that we have ends up being almost like a focus group and mm. trying to help us guide you know, what, what, what their preferences are, what do they expect the, the industry to become in a few years. And that's become, to be honest, one of our uh, most interesting sources of information, having the consumers at our factory for a whole day Talking with them, playing with the tobaccos, blending with them, playing with the you know with the rolling technique, and we get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information from them too, and a lot of inspiration too. Mm. Yeah, and I gotta say, and I, and I've been a part of that, and and it's and it's truly two way interactive. One thing I loved is um, when you took us through the history of the company. Um, there's a great presentation, Paul, that they do, and they take you through that that whole history of Hoya of, of Hoya de Nicaragua and it, tying the company. Um, the company's development with the history of Nicaragua, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, you know, just kind of being in that factory, you feel that history as it's going through. So that's a great presentation that you've given us, too, as the, as the consumer. And I know I appreciated that a lot. Yeah, what we try to do is, is uh, and through the coordination with Jewish State, is to have an integral experience of, of cigar. When you go to a shop and you light up your cigar, uh, you obviously enjoy it in, in company with your friends or even by yourself, but you're only smoking the cigar. When you go down there, you experience everything from the seed to, to the final smoke, and you'll become part of that. And uh, what we expect and what our objective is, is that people start appreciating what goes, make, what goes behind making Every single cigar that we produce in our factories, be it Drew Estate, be it ours, or any other cigar factory that manufactures premium handmade long filler cigars. There's a lot of time, dedication, passion, a lot of hard human work behind every single cigar that ultimately uh, justifies uh, not the price tag, but the value of each single cigar. And uh, we feel that smoking a cigar because it's only a means for something. The cigars is not an end in itself. Uh, you smoke a cigar because you have a larger purpose, just be to enjoy the company, the moment, the celebration, the book that you're reading. The cigars are ultimately a means. Uh, nobody can claim that cigars in themselves are, are a purpose uh, or, or the end in themselves. So our objective is that people, especially consumers, start realizing that... Uh, the way to truly enjoy cigars is to understand more than just what goes uh, into the cigar, what the tobaccos make up the blend, but also the, to meet the people who roll the cigar, the people who control the quality of the cigar, the people who spend their lives, like the, the, the ladies that I mentioned before, that spend more than 47 years dedicated to working with tobacco, while at the same time experiencing Nicaragua as a country, the country that because of its qualities in, in soil, in climate, its origins as a volcanic country, gives all these attributes to the product that you guys ultimately love. Uh, and, uh, you know, cigars are not a product of, you know, boom, uh, blowing air in, into, the, into the air and, and, and having a perfect cigar. It, there's a lot of involved, and the more that you learn 
the more that you get educated that what goes behind making a cigar, the place, the climate, the temperature, the quality of the soil, the type of seeds that you use, and, and all of the steps, I feel that you better understand what you are enjoying, and hence your experience will become much, much better. So that's almost like a commercial. I invite everybody, every smoker <laughs> out there to learn more about, not only in our way in, in Cigar Safari, but in general, to learn more about the cigars. You can, you know, you can go on YouTube nowadays and find hundreds of videos on, on, on cigars being rolled in many countries and, and people talking about the process, talking about the history of the families that are responsible for making those cigars. And uh, I feel that that in itself is, is an experience that adds to the value of the cigars. Yeah, and Juan, actually, there's another component that you're now doing um, that you've been involved with, and I wanted to talk a little about that, and it's a great point. And so you're actually spearheading um, this year's um, Nicaraguan Cigar Festival, correct? Yes. Well, so, this is going to be the fifth uh, edition of the Nicaraguan Cigar Festival. We've had it since 2010 with a year that was interrupted. And uh, I was elected this year as the president of the Nicaraguan Tobacco Association, which uh, together uh, groups uh, the 17 most important tobacco companies in the country, including tobacco grower, processors, plus cigar makers. And uh, amongst us, you have you know the big ones that you already know, like uh, obviously Hoya de Nicaragua, Drew Estate, Padron, Placencia, my Father Cigars, uh, STG, Oliva, and many other companies that together make up the core of the, of the Nicaraguan cigar industry. And uh, every year or so, we come together to celebrate the successes of our industry and what we've achieved as, as a group of companies. And we celebrate it in the Nicaraguan Cigar Festival. And this is happening in January, the second week of January, from the 12th to the 16th. And uh, it's, it's an, uh, another commercial. It's uh, one of those great experiences, unique experiences in which you get to enjoy hand by hand and together with the manufacturers, the brand owners, and uh, you know, enjoy all the social activities plus visits to plantations, to factories, learn more about the process and more, learn more about the country. And it's, it's a beautiful experience. Every tobacco producing country has its own festival. Uh, the Dominican has its Pro Cigars, Cuba has its Habano Festival, and now and uh, we also have this, this, this unique opportunity for everybody to enjoy this, this development of the industry while sharing the knowledge and the personal relationship with the manufacturers and the brand owners. Yeah, and you know, a lot of folks are familiar with obviously Pro Cigar is probably the most popular, but what's a little different about the Nicaragua one as opposed to Pro Cigar? Well, in our case, uh, we are more focused. No, he froze there for a second, Juan. I think, yep, I thought it was me. Oh, he's frozen good too. Oh, we're gonna have to call him back. I wonder if the lizards. I wonder if the lizards got the it. The lizards definitely. It's lizard we, interference, lizard attenuation. Yeah, for folks who didn't see Juan last time on the show, um, literally some lizards started crawling around his office. It was awesome. He was in. It was a yeah, great. It was, it was, the wall is a light color in the background, so the lizard really kind of stood out. Yeah, well, looking at. I was in the studio that day. I remember, and I'm well looking. I'm like, what is that? Was that during a, a, a marathon episode we were doing? Well. No, that was, uh, I came up a few weeks after the marathon episode, okay. and yes. uh, that was when I was in town, yeah, and I just happened to pop in. I remember that night. So we, uh, yeah, we're trying to get he's, one he's back. He's not coming back. I'm, I'm hoping his internet connection didn't go totally down. I know, it was, it was going good for a while. The internet's an amazing thing when it works. Yeah. I have to say we've been, we've been pretty lucky with a lot of our guests. We haven't we haven't lost one and couldn't get it back. This be, might be the first. I mean, if anything, I've had poor luck with the internet. Well, than, I, than I tell you what, well, doing this ten years, uh, you know, recently it's been better, but in the early days, so to speak, uh, it was a lot more common. No, and uh, we do, and we got we got good guys behind the scenes who, who kind of can keep it going too, which. 
makes it a little easier, a lot easier. A lot say. easier, yeah. A lot easier, yeah. I think we've got him back for voice. Okay. Juan, are you there? Yes, gentlemen, and welcome to Nicaragua. Yeah, this is uh, it happens. a it light happens. Uh, uh, electricity uh, failure. So sorry about that. Juan, I, I want to ask you, uh, primarily in your it cigars. Happen, sorry about it. I'm trying okay. to get some light here. And, uh, and Oh, so you lost power. You completely lost your power then. Uh-oh. He lost power. Is that what he said? I think he yeah, lost there's power. Yeah, no, there's no power. There's no light. Oh, and I just okay. uh, plugged in it. So, Juan, um, primarily using Nicaraguan tobacco in your cigars, um, do you have any plans to use uh, Dominican? You know, I used it in the binder in the, in the new Cuatro Cinco, um, but any more plans to incorporate more Dominican or other tobaccos from other countries? Well, actually, we, uh, we have quite a lot of tobaccos from different origins at the factory. Um, uh, a lot of the private blends that we manufacture for other companies or for other brands use tobaccos other than Nicaragua. In the case of uh, Hoya de Nicaragua, our specialty is the use of, of Nicaraguan tobacco. So we try to focus on, on the core, on showcasing the, the good attributes of flavor and strength of, um, of our tobaccos or original tobaccos. However, we are very open. In fact, we're developing a couple of blends uh, that will probably be out soon that incorporate Nicaraguan, but also using other tobaccos uh, from around the world. Uh, at the factory, we have tobaccos from, from almost everywhere, in fact. We have tobaccos from, from Indonesia, from, from uh, the United States, from Mexico, from Brazil, from Honduras, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador. Uh, you name it. We have all those tobaccos, and we generally are playing with them, especially offering uh, for the international market, meaning uh, Europe and, and, and other countries. And uh, you will find uh, blends with such characteristics soon coming from our factory. And so do you have any cigars that you're coming out with next uh, that you can share with us and our listeners? Yes. Although we're still promoting uh, Cuatro Cinco because it's, it's our mm -hmm. most recent uh, introduction. We are um, working on a couple of blends for next year. One of them, uh, it's going to be a very special celebration cigar for, uh, for one of our core blends, which will, be, uh, will, will have its birthday uh, next year. I, I won't go much into detail, but uh, it would be one of those cigars that uh, people will rush to get uh, because it would be a, a, a reconnection with the core of Nicaraguan tobacco also. And more towards the later part of the year, we'll also be coming out with something uh, not so focused on Nicaragua, but more in the use in the Nicaraguan tobacco to blend with the other uh, origins of, of tobacco. So uh, although nice. I cannot disclose the names yet and all that at the core, we, you can expect two, two interesting projects for next year. Excellent, excellent. Juan, Juan, how's Hoya Hoya Red seemed like it was a monster hit for you guys last year. Um, it's become a favorite of Paul and mine, too. Um, and it was such a very different cigar than what Hoya was known for. Is that cigar still doing very well for you? It is, actually is. Uh, it's become our second strongest brand around the world. Uh, we're still um, getting it out there in other countries, especially in Europe that uh, we couldn't uh, get it to last year. But uh, it continues to grow strong. What we did with that cigar, and, and we spoke about this long last time in, in the previous interview, uh, was that we were providing a different profile of smoking, but using the core of Nicaraguan tobacco. Instead of showcasing the strength that we generally did, we're showcasing, showcasing the, the flavor in a very balanced medium body cigar. And uh, the way we target it was for, for, for not only the entry-level smoker, but for the, the, the guy who wants to smoke a very flavorful cigar any moment of the day without being intimidated by the strength. And uh, I think that the cigar is very successful because of that and also because of the price point, which is very favorable. So it's very, very, very easy to get, you know, very easy to smoke. And I think that nowadays a lot of people are looking for that. Yeah, and what I it's not too complicated, not too 
intimidating and still being a great price. Yeah, and what I liked about it too was, you know, a lot of times, without, you know, it was a great cigar for me, like I said, any time of the day. It was a good morning smoke. But, you know, a lot of times morning smoke, you tend, a lot of people go Connecticut shade, but here's something different, you know, and that's that's what I really enjoyed about that cigar. It provided this other option um, for my morning smoke, which I really liked. Now, we just introduced in Europe a, a small, petite, uh, half Corona red, which did very well. Uh, and uh, we're going to probably be bringing that to, to the United States very soon. So it's still the same core uh, Hoya red with a lot of flavor, but j just in a shorter format, which is, makes it for a quicker, uh, quicker grab, a quicker cigar. So I will probably be, be having that very soon in the United States, especially towards the winter where people, you know, have limited time and, and don't want to spend, you know, a whole hour and a half outside in the cold smoking. They'll still get in to enjoy the very nice flavor of Hoya Red in, in a very short time span. Excellent. And did you, did you release that at Intertabac this year? Yes, that was our introduction in Intertabac. We try to spread our, our releases between the two shows so that everybody gets a fair treatment, you know. Uh, and, uh, and once we've satisfied the, the requirements, the orders for Europe, we're going to start bringing it to the United States. That's awesome. Excellent. Juan, it's always wonderful to have you on the show. Will, did you want to do a, uh, contest right now? Or wait we could do, end? we could do, uh, one right now. Okay. We could do one right now. Juan, I'm going to give you the uh, – well, let's give you what you win first. Um, yeah, Juan donated some nice uh, prizes tonight, so thank you. Yes. You're going to win a four-pack of the new Hoya de Nicaragua Cuatro Cinco Reserva Especial. Uh, it's a, it's a four-pack. You're going to win two of the Torpedo size and two of the Toro size uh, in this, in this four-pack. Uh, oh, which are very good cigars. I, I smoked the Toro tonight. I can't wait to try the, the Torpedo. Um, what was uh, Juan during the interview mentioned the name of one of the rollers uh, who was turning to the side, uh, turning around on the back of the band. What was her name? Email, email that answer to the show at StoeGeeks.com to win the Hoya de Nicaragua Cuatro Cinco four pack plus a Hoya de Nicaragua hat. Plus a Hoya de Nicaragua cutter. How about that? That's a wow. hard question, by the way. Yes. Well, we're giving a good prize too. Yeah, we're giving a good prize. So I thought it would. Uh, I thought it was very fair. Our, Juan, our audience is really good. I mean, we've thrown some of these, and and I wouldn't be surprised if we have a winner by the break. Yeah, people pay attention. Yeah. They do, uh, and the hats are awesome. By the way, uh, just the they're like fitted hats. They're really they're really comfortable to wear. I, and I, the car Cutter is a limited edition sidecar uh, branded cutter that we are not selling and giving only. We give that away only for raffles or special uh, special events uh, when we're doing promotion of Cuatro Cinco or very special things. So that's a that's a hard cutter to get by. It's an awesome cutter. I actually have a Zycar uh, butterfly cutter here. It's not the Hoya de Nicaragua one, but um, it's a very, very good cutter. I like it a lot. And um, the one in the prize pack is black with the Hoya de Nicaragua written on it. It's a very nice cutter. So that's, well, that's a great prize, prize pack. Juan, thank you very much for that. Very good. Well, You're welcome. Always a pleasure. Yes. Thank you very much, Juan, for appearing on the Stoey Geek Show. And with that, we we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and do our debonair ideal segment for this evening. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 